I'm Anthony Woodruff Jr., also known as Tony Paul. I'm a saxophonist, I'm a flute player, I'm a musician, I am an educator, I am a father, a husband, a teacher, a friend, and most importantly, I am a musician. Well, being from a musical family has its perks, but then obviously there are some nights where parents are out uh, performing. But I remember my earliest, my earliest memory of being the child of a musician is being in studio, sleeping on the floor while my dad recorded because my dad played with Song Revolution. So for the most part, I had a normal childhood. You know, went to school, had friends, did normal things. I only really got into music as I went into high school. So yeah, I'd say it, it, it evolved pretty much like any other childhood. My dad is one of the main reasons why I started music. He's a musician and initially I wanted to play a trumpet just like him. But he said, you know, your name is Anthony, my name is Anthony, there's going to be a lot of confusion, so you probably should not play trumpet. So the next choice was saxophone, and it just so happened that I played saxophone very well as a young musician, as a young person. So that developed, and once I got into music, it no longer became about my father, but more about my own passions that developed as I started getting more and more into music. But my mom was, she, she used to be a member of La Petite Musicale. So singing was a large part of my childhood. I sang in, in primary school choir, and then later on, I sang with marionettes and, you know, church choir. So it's not just my dad, but it's also my mom. I have an uncle as well, who is a music festival champion. He's a singer. And then I have cousins who are into music. My brother is also into music as well. So it's generally the family at large. So I'm Anthony Woodruff Jr. And most people that know me performing have heard the name Tony Paul. Some people have heard Tony Paul and it's like, but wait, no, that's Anthony Woodruff. It's like, yes, my middle name is Paul. And very, very early on, because my dad is also involved in music, I made a, a concerted effort to try to distinguish myself and separate myself from my dad, who was heavily involved. So the decision to be called Tony Paul was influenced by my grandmother, who often called me Tony Paul. And for the past, well, I'd say about a decade, I've been using that as my stage name. It's sometimes difficult where I'm at work and students know me as Anthony Woodruff and then it's, oh, sir, is it Tony Paul as well? It's like, no, you can call me Anthony. But I made a decision a long time ago to separate myself and, and have my own identity as a musician in, in Trinidad and Tobago and in the region at large. Well, the saxophone was something that I didn't initially decide to play it, but once I started playing it, because in first form, everyone has to play the recorder and it's a most annoying instrument to most people, but it actually is sort of a introduction to woodwind instruments. So I was pretty proficient on the recorder. So once I started playing saxophone, it felt very natural. And then after that, I picked up flute started playing clarinet. Uh, later on, I even started playing the bassoon, which is a double reeded instrument that not very many people know <laughs> what it is. And late, even later than that, I also started playing the oboe, but not as a performance instrument, just to know how it works. Right, so the saxophone is a family. You have small ones, the small straight one that most people know Kenny G playing. That's the soprano saxophone. There's an even smaller one, but the, the four primary saxophones are soprano, alto, tenor, and baritone, pretty much like the human voices. Uh, 
sometimes it's difficult to choose which one is my favorite because I see different instruments as different voices that suit the mood and suit the music in particular. So sometimes I lean towards the alto saxophone, other times I play tenor. Uh, I've recently been playing a lot more soprano saxophone, which initially I shied away from. But I think if I had to choose, I would go with the tenor saxophone because one of my favorite musicians of all time, Michael Brecker, plays the tenor saxophone. And I think it's a really beautiful, warm voiced instrument that sounds amazing if you put in the work. So my decision to go to the UK was kind of influenced by a cousin of mine who I grew up with, but she migrated to the UK. And initially I spent a year in London and then I moved to the north of England to Leeds to go to Leeds College of Music. I started the pursuit of a higher education late as compared to most. I started when I was 26. So the choice to go to the US wasn't one that I had in my mind because I was thinking, okay, well, I started later. My program needs to be shorter. And most bachelor programs in the UK are three years versus the four year standard in the US. So that was one of the deciding factors, but also because I had family in the UK, whereas I didn't really have close family in the US for support systems and such. So that was one of the main reasons why I went to the UK. London was an incredibly busy and shocking environment for me um, because there's so many things going on. It's easy to get lost in the bustle. But fortunately, I was around friends and I was able to go to jam sessions, had the odd gig here and there. But it, it was really a learning experience for me in terms of life and the things that you have to do, the sacrifices that you have to make to be successful and to try to fulfill your desires and your dreams. Just the level of professionalism that the musicians that I interacted with while I was in the UK, particularly in London, I remember one instance where I was playing with, it was basically a carnival show with UK musicians and Caribbean musicians. And I went to my first rehearsal and one of the musicians that was supposed to be there was late and not five minutes late, he was like late. So the band leader actually called another musician who was living nearby and he turned up. And when the other musician came, someone was sitting in his chair. And to me, that spoke volumes because in the Caribbean, we have Caribbean time. In the UK, in the US, there's no such thing. So yeah, it, it really informs what it means to be a musician and what it means to be a professional in terms of treating it as much as it's something that one should enjoy and should love as it's a craft, it's business, it's work, it's something that deserves the attention to detail. And that, that came from that experience, I'd say. Definitely one of the first ones was Clive Zander rest in peace. Clive, when I was very, very young and young as a musician, not very good, took me under his wing and had me around at rehearsals. I even played a couple gigs with him. And then later on, I played with him quite a lot. And it really showed me that you get better by being supported by those that are better than you but obviously doing the work that you have to do. So Clive is definitely one of those. Uh, another mentor, Ralph Robertson, who I didn't have a lot of time with him, but I really valued his outlook on the music business and how he interacted with folks. He was very, very to the point, not someone that would 
saying something just for saying it. Every time he said something, there was a meaning behind it. So Raf is another one. Ray Hallman, who I spent a lot of years playing with Ray, straight out of high school. Um, Ray actually taught at Fatima College where I attended school. And seeing him in school, I did not know that Ray Hallman was Ray Hallman, or sorry, Dr. Hallman, no. Um, and he, like Clive, took me under his wing. I played with him, I've been playing with him, and just, again, really supporting young musicians and giving them a forum to express themselves and learn from men, like icons in the craft. Um, there's one, one other musician that I must always mention because he changed my outlook on what it means to perform and to improvise. Ron Acqui, who I played with years, years ago in a Latin band. One of my first experiences being on the jazz scene in Trinidad and Tobago was a gig put on by Chantal Estelle in Alice Glen, where Arturo Tappin was one of the headliners. And there was a jam session at the end of the gig, and I had to play. Arturo Tappin is a saxophone player. I'm a saxophone player. Young musician, nowhere in his class. And I was panicking. I was so afraid. And Ron Acqui told me, because he saw me and he's like, how are you going, Tony? And I explained to him how I was feeling. And he said, you don't have to worry about that. The great thing about music is that if you are honest to who you are as a musician and you play and you play with all your heart, people will receive it. Different people are at different levels and that's fine. And that resonated with me and it's something that I've kept like well over 20 years later. And it's something that I always share with any students or any young musicians that I interact with because music is something that should speak to us and through us and it's about that conversation that we have with audience members so being truthful to who you are it's inviting it brings the audience members in when you are not being truthful and you're trying to do something that you really shouldn't because you're not ready yet it makes it apparent to any audience members that you're not really you're not really on it so i i mean i've met tons of musicians over the years and each musician you, know, you can learn something from but i would say those those have been the people that have had the biggest impact on me musically okay so the biggest one for me was in 2016 with paquito de rivera who is a cuban musician he's also a NEA jazz master anything to do with Latin music. He is like one of the greatest musicians to, to walk the face of the earth. And I had the opportunity to attend a week long workshop where it was him and his ensemble and a bunch of us musicians from all parts of the world. And to me, again, it really highlighted what being a professional and what that means because we got the music beforehand but we only had a week to prepare a two-hour concert and when i say a week the workshop started on monday the performance was on friday so that's monday tuesday wednesday thursday four days of rehearsals and at the end of it a two-hour long concert so that was one of the most remarkable things that i've ever been a part of I've also had the opportunity to go to Dominica for the Creole Jazz Festival. I've been to Chile and played at some clubs down there doing some jam sessions. But I would say definitely that experience in New York at Carnegie Hall with Paquito and his ensemble and other young musicians was definitely the highlight for me. Okay, so the biggest one for me was in 2016 with Paquito de Rivera, 
who is a Cuban musician. He's also a NEA jazz master. Anything to do with Latin music, he is like one of the greatest musicians to, to walk the face of the earth. And I had the opportunity to attend a week-long workshop where it was him and his ensemble and a bunch of us musicians from all parts of the world. And to me, again, it really highlighted what being a professional and what that means. Because we got the music beforehand, but we only had a week to prepare a two-hour concert. And when I say a week, the workshop started on Monday, the performance was on Friday. So that's Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, four days of rehearsals. And at the end of it, a two hour long concert. So that was one of the most remarkable things that I've ever been a part of. I've also had the opportunity to go to Dominica for the Creole Jazz Festival. I've been to Chile and played at some clubs down there doing some jam sessions. But I would say definitely that experience in New York at Carnegie Hall with Paquito and his ensemble and other young musicians was definitely the highlight for me in terms of international experiences. Well, coming back out from, from the two year shutdown, a lot of events are happening. So I think Generally, there's a lot of potential where our industry is, is at right now. There's a lot of help in terms of Music TT. Um, there's educational opportunities at UE, at UTT, where I work, Costat, even CUC or University of Southern Caribbean. Yeah, um, but I think there's always a lot of work and the mindset of the musicians, as well as the mindset of the audience, is something that needs to shift for us creatives to have a chance. And why I say that is because we've gotten so accustomed to going to an event, and it's about the event and less about supporting live music, that most audience members, it's really, really a dedicated small group of people that make that effort. And I think that goes back to the value that's placed on the creative industries. I'm sure people have heard, oh, you can play music, but get a real job. I'm sure people have heard that, that, that thing. And that speaks, that speaks volumes to, to the mindset of what people think the arts are. And I think once that changes and young people are allowed to pursue their passions, because creativity is something that is the lifeblood of society. You can't have entertainment without creatives, without music or without drama, or without art, without anything that has that creative spark. So our industry, I think we are starting to get there, but like I said, some, some mindsets need to be shifted for the musicians, the idea of professionalism and standing for their values and demanding respect. And while, while putting out a very high quality product, the product needs to be high, right? That's the first thing. Um, but also with the audience, we need to make sure that people receive and accept and support what we're doing. The workshop performance at Carnegie, but recently I had the opportunity to lead a group of young musicians at a performance in Trinidad put on by Production One, who normally run Jazz Artists on the Greens. And out of 12 musicians, 10 of them were either current students of mine or former students of the Academy for the Performing Arts where I work. So for me, that was something that I was incredibly proud of because the level of performance was exceedingly high. I think I did a great job <laughs> as well. 
but more so the support from my students and also from the alumni of, of UTT really made it a, a wonderful performance where there was pride and just joy at being a part of something that looked forward because Ray Holman was on stage with me, Dr. Ray Holman was on stage with me. And I think the greatest compliment was that he was very happy with the work that I had done and was happy to see the work that I was doing with those students. And it just went to show that the idea of, of mentorship is something that is exceedingly important and valuable. And it's not simply a matter of, I work at the academy and that's my job. I think each one of those young musicians are aware that I support them on their journey, regardless of the institution. So I think that for me is one of, well, it is the most proud I've been of a performance to date. In any institution, there are like a top 10% of students that are focused and really diligent. And then there are others that aren't fully aware of what they've gotten themselves into. But depending on the culture of the institution, it can either bring some of them up to that higher level or dissuade them from moving forward. I think that the work that myself and my colleagues at UTT have been doing has been more towards the latter in terms of trying to bring students up to a respectable level and focusing on professionalism, focusing on refining your craft. For me, what I've been attempting to do is have professionals, people that are active in the industry, come in to speak to, to my students, to give them some realism in terms of what it actually takes to be you know, on the job. Because oftentimes education focuses on specific skills, but not always real life experience. It's sometimes difficult to get that in because there's so much to cover when you're trying to, to nurture young musicians. So I wouldn't say that there's much missing from the students themselves because I've had the opportunity to work with some incredible young musicians who I know that if not already in a few years to come, they will be doing great things. But I think in terms of support from the powers that be, from the government, from I guess the public at large in terms of going out and supporting young people anytime they're trying to do stuff in terms of putting on shows or any venture. I think that's what's really lacking in our space. In terms of the musicians and, and the young musicians, I think we are definitely in safe hands. I've been on the Trinity Jazz Project. I've recorded a couple albums with Alan Parley. I recorded with Vonnet Bigfoot. I was on an album with Aidan Hagley, his, his first release, and a couple little projects here and there. Uh, but definitely coming out from the work that I tried to get done during the pandemic, that was one of the main motivations behind that self-development because it is time for me to do my own main featured solo album and I think definitely within the next year or so that should be happening because I've already started putting some compositions together and thinking about what covers I'd be doing if I'm doing any so yeah that is definitely the next thing on the, the vision board so to say and it's stated here so it's definitely going to happen <laughs> <laughs>